Welcome to MMA Podcast. My name is Luke Basin, and I am honored to have first time guests of the show, Kelly Crossface Uddinson. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. How are you? It's great having you on the show. I had your wife a couple times, uh, Wendy, and she's an, uh, really an up and coming amateur. And, and so it's been incredible to follow her. Got to see her fight for 247 um, probably about a year ago now, or at least yeah, it's about, about, years, about a year, year ago. ago. So got to see her in action. And she had a really impressive uh, standing rear naked choke back take into a rear naked choke, very fast transition, really fast transition. But this is all about your upcoming fight. Uh, you've been, you, you haven't fought in five years professionally. You have a great record of 10 and three, uh, three and one in Bellator. For people that don't know you, they should, they should go back and look. But you've announced this as a retirement fight. So let's jump right in to your uh, May 27th fight upcoming against Randy Billet for Conflict MMA 57. Two big questions. Why come out of retirement? Um, to then fight a retirement fight? What are you looking forward to in this fight? Well, um, I would say probably like 12 weeks ago, I got knee surgery <clears throat> and uh, I was sitting at home a lot and I was bored and one day I was just feeling some sort of way. And uh, that actually what happened is they, they the, it's in Columbia, South Carolina and they had found this guy for a local guy there and it fell apart for whatever reason. And I was like, man, shoot, I'll, I'll fight that guy. And then it just it just worked out. And I didn't really wasn't like planning on coming out of retirement. I was enjoying not training all the time. But it's also been really nice to like get back in shape and work hard for something. And um, it also is a good reminder why I'm retired because I'm old. And uh, it gets it's it's hard. It's not the same as when I was 28, 29. So uh so yeah, so I was just bored one day, and you know how you get your like, well, I, you're bored one day, and you're just like, I'll do it, I'll fight, I want to fight, and then I'm just like, oh crap, now it's like two, three weeks away, and I'm like, oh, I'm fighting soon. Well, you're no, you're no uh, newbie to fighting, even though it's been some years. Uh, oh. You have fought with some of the best Bellator and other promotions had to offer. And you, your first retirement, if we call it that, you're five years away, came off of a win. And, you know, most fighters don't get to do that. I, I know in the in-between, you are up and running as a gym coach owner. So talk a little bit about that. What's it been like building that gym? Um, obviously, your, your wife is a big fighter out of that gym, and I'm sure you have other fighters up and coming. So talk about that gym and what brought you into gym ownership and being a coach. Well, um, so... It also, I mean, I've always kind of known I wanted to own a gym, maybe more because of wrestling when I was doing wrestling and I always did like private lessons and I always taught classes. And I was like, I was a wrestling coach at American Pop Team for five, six years. And um, after <clears throat> I knew after uh, I was done fighting, which it kind of got taken away from me. I got, I want, I got hit by a car towards the end of my career and oh. it took me out for a long time. That's why I actually kind of quit fighting. And then that fight that I had five years ago was like, I did it because I wanted to see if I could still do it. And then I realized I might've, uh, I mean, I did good in the fight and everything, but I, I just didn't feel the same. And I, oh. and I was like 30, I don't know. Three. 33 at that time. And so I was like, I didn't want to climb back up. I had, because I hadn't fight, fought in so long, I would have to put together five fights and that's like two, three years. And I had just opened my gym and uh, I wanted to focus on that and then bringing in the newer generation of guys. And I had a big group of guys at that time in Nevada. So I, um, I chose to do that and, uh, and it's worked really good, but how the gym started really, um, I started off actually just training people outside at a park at like five in the morning. I would just meet get everybody together. We would go do kickboxing in the park. And while we were there, I would just like random people who would wake up early and go running. I would just bring extra gloves and I'd be like, Hey, it's five in the morning. So there's nobody else out there. So they have to talk to me. So I just tell them to come try kickboxing and half the time they would. And so I just, got a bunch of people together and it kept growing and eventually the park kicked me out and was like, you got to have a permit to do this. Oh. So 
then after that, I moved in. Uh, my buddy had a plumbing business and he had extra room in his uh, warehouse. And so I set up a cage in the warehouse and I started doing classes out of a plumbing plumbing place. And then after that grew, the owner was like, yeah, we can't have this many people coming in here. It's just a plumbing shop, not a gym. Yeah. It's like five people is good. When it's like 20 people, you got to do something. So then that's when I decided to like rent a spot. And so I went on like Craigslist. I found the cheapest spot I could find. Uh, it didn't have air conditioning. It didn't have a bathroom. It didn't have running water. It was just like a, a upstairs to a bike shop. And so I started the gym off there. It grew from there. And this is in Reno, Nevada. And uh, it grew from there. So then I had to get a bigger spot. And then um, I had that gym for like five years. And I grew up pretty big. And then COVID hit. And that kind of destroyed everything. And at that time, my landlord also raised my rent like $2,000 at the gym. And that's a big hit during COVID when I could half my members uh, canceled their membership. And, not, you know, and that's just, I would too, if I was like, yeah. it was like over a year, you would be paying dues. And that's, that's, uh, that's hard to do. And so um, I, 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 I worked three jobs and I kept the gym going. But then after the lease was up, um, it was just too much. And Reno was growing like crazy at that time. So rent everywhere was super expensive. So, we had an opportunity to come out to North Carolina and, and open up a gym. And at that time, me and Wendy had just gotten married and we wanted to buy a house. And in Reno, for $250,000, $300,000, you're getting a single wide trailer in the middle of nowhere, you know? So we decided to come out here and buy a house. And we bought a house and we opened up a gym um, with a friend. And it's grown like crazy since. And so we're, uh, I have a gym full of just brand new people. And then we had a bunch of fighters come out with us. And then we picked up some fighters when we came out here. And so now we, I have a gym full of guys and a bunch of young guys that are about to make their debut at, or have their first or second fight. And what's, what's your current gym name? I know you've bounced around and thanks for the history. But what's the current uh, gym name down there in North Carolina? It's called Battleborn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and MMA. Okay, gotcha. That is awesome. Was that the name you were using out in Reno? Or did that change when you came in? No, so the gym out in Reno was called Combat Sport and Fitness. Okay, all right. So Battleborn. And that gym's actually uh, my assistant coach down there, as in Zeus. He actually took that gym over. So that gym is still going oh, in Reno. Nice. And so he's uh, one of my brown belts underneath me. So he runs the gym and uh, I try and go out there once or twice a year to do belt ceremonies and all that kind of stuff. And um, just kind of keep the, the relationship good because, you know, he has a bunch of fighters out there. Some of them, my old fighters and they're still fighting. So sometimes we try and get those guys fights out here and stuff like that. Well, that's actually really nice that it didn't have to disband when you left. It's nice that it's still going because you made it through the worst part, you know, with COVID and yeah, all right. that. So, but I would think North Carolina is, you mentioned about being more cost effective, but um, I'm an East Coast guy. I've lived on two different islands in New Jersey and really always enjoyed, although North Carolina is prettier, but I've always enjoyed the East Coast. What was it like getting out? to the, I guess you're not right on the East Coast because you're in High Point, but what what was that transition like? And do you like North Carolina? I like it a lot. I lived out here before. So I went to college, at Newberry College. I wrestled there. Uh, it's a Division II school. And I, I lived there. And then afterwards, from there, I moved to Miami and I was, uh, or Coconut Creek, and I was wrestling coach and at American Top Team. And then I moved to Asheville, North Carolina too. So I'd been kind of all over that this general area. So um, it wasn't a big change for me because I kind of already knew what to expect. I like the weather a lot better out here. It's a lot warmer. Uh, and then just the people are nicer out here. Everybody's a little bit more friendlier. Um, I like Southern food. So it works. And and overall, since you mentioned being a coach down there 
at ATT. And I saw that on your tapology, which hasn't been updated because you haven't had a fight in so long. They still have you fighting out of, you know, the, yeah. the Florida gym. Uh, what was it like? Obviously, you're you're a great fighter. You're 10 and 3 as a pro. Um, you kind of explained the, the accident that sort of limited your career. But uh, what was it like being sort of a, a coach? I mean, not, not, not sort of a coach. You are a very good coach. I was almost going to say, like, you're a coach first, fighter second, at least from what you're saying with your mindset. Well, well when I was at APT um... – I was a fighter first and coach second okay. at that time. I ran one class a day and I did private lessons there, but I, my main focus when I was there was my fighting. Um, but yeah, that was a huge shock and change. So when I went down to ATT, I had only wrestled and I had very limited boxing and I had no jujitsu. I had no kickboxing. I didn't know how to throw a kick. I didn't know how to throw a knee. I barely knew how to throw punches um, and so I went down there and for like the first two years, I would literally get my butt kicked every single day, like bad because my training partners also were like, uh, Hector Lombard, um, Tiago Silva, Tiago Alves, um, um, uh, like so many guys that came through Mark Hunt was one of my partners. Um, you know, Glover Texiero was one of my main partners out there. And so. I had to learn like real quick how to do it and uh, or else I would just keep getting my butt kicked every day and sparring was no fun. And uh, because, you know, in a big gym and you have a ton of people on the mat, you get a takedown. You can't like stay and work on the ground. You have to come right back up to your feet. And it's like I used all my energy to take all these people down and then I'm getting stood back up and then get my butt kicked. And so I had to learn how to sit back and strike and calm it down and um and pick and choose my shots. And it was, it was a huge thing, especially because where I came from, I was like the top dog, you know, I was the big fish in a really small pond. And when I went there, I was like, Oh, I actually suck at fighting. I'm, I'm not very good. And so I had a big learning curve right when I went out there. Now, thankfully I was a high level wrestler in college and that kind of carried me through in the beginning of my career. But then once you win some fights, you're going to come across other wrestlers too, that, uh, that, to possibly stop your takedown. So then what do you have to do? You have to learn how to strike. Yeah. I mean, th thanks for obviously giving the recap and, and the challenge. It's wonderful to see a pure dominant wrestler like you transition to MMA, but there's a lot to build up from there. Just like if somebody's a dominant kickboxer, which we just saw the, the champ at 185 coming from a dominant kickboxing, he still has a lot to learn from the, the grappling. I was looking back in your history, and at least to me, the name that stands out is that you uh, beat by neck crank uh, Vol Vulcan um, Olsdemir, and you were the only person to, for people that remember, he ended up then going on a, a great win streak. He was undefeated when you beat him, and then he was 14-1 and one when he took on DC Cormier for the 205 UFC belt, which he has since he lost, but what was it like back then in 2018 watching that fight? I'm assuming you did. Being the only guy to have beaten Vulcan Ozdemir, he's 14-1. and one. When he's walking to the cage, no matter what happened, when he's walking to the cage to D.C., did that kind of make you excited that you were the one on his 14-1? Yeah, um, yeah, so um, I feel like uh, I feel like my career did get cut short a little bit, and if you look back at my record, the guys I fought were all like from the very beginning, all really, really good guys. Like I fought him when he was like 10 and 0. Bellator brought me in to lose like yeah. every single fight. They like at, from the very beginning, I was fighting like guys that were 10 and 0, 11 and 0, 23 and something. Like, and all those guys after I beat them all went on to go do like Felipe Lenz is another one I beat. Um, he went and won a million dollars in the PFL the next year. I beat him for less than a million dollars, way less than a million dollars. I, and I, and I was, you know, at that point I was done fighting, but I was like, you know what, if I call a couple people out and maybe they'll give me those fights, I'll, I'll make some money too. So, but it didn't work, but, um, so yeah, there was like him. And then there was Rodney Wallace who had fought a bunch in the UFC and he was a good fight in Bellator. And then they put me, uh, then I made it like all the way to the finals of that light heavyweight tournament. 
and they did not want me there. And, uh, but I thought, uh, what's his name? Liam McGrary. Uh, and he's, he's a stud. He, he triangled me. He like did the crazy inverted triangle to me and got me and uh, that guy's just good. And, um, yeah. And I feel, I feel like uh, I could have did a lot more in the sport if I had a little bit more time. Uh, but you know, and that's also why I push Wendy so hard to fight as much as she can as an amateur and get all that experience. Cause once you turn pro, it's like, it's off to the races and you got to be ready to go. Yeah. And speaking of, speaking of Wendy, great transition there. Uh, what's it been like? Obviously you guys are married. Congratulations. And you have a lot of up and coming fighters. Um, and I hope to have them on. I'd love to, you let me know. I'd love to have the, the fighters on, you know, on MMA Fancast to talk about their careers so I can follow not just you and your wife, but also your gym. But what's it like balancing that? She is incredible. She just had a great kickboxing win at an Air Force base or something yeah, like yeah. that. It was incredible. I got to watch the whole fight on Facebook. So thanks to whoever posted that to Facebook because it was fantastic. But uh, she's incredible. As an amateur, she's won a couple belts. Um, so what, what what's it like coaching her? And where do you where do you see her future going? Um, well, it's been a long journey with Wendy as far as like when she started, she really didn't know anything at all. And Wendy is a testament of hard work and dedication and putting the time in and trusting the process and trusting her coach. Um, she does basically whatever I ask her to do and it's worked. And I think it's a good blueprint for my other fighters to follow and understand that that doesn't happen overnight. You're not going to, you know, but when you are ready, we are going to push it, you know? So when he trained, basically for a year straight before she had a fight. And then once she had a fight, we were basically fighting or trying to fight every month, sometimes twice a month, uh, jujitsu tournaments in between combat jujitsu matches in between, you know, and, and just cause she didn't have a background. She wasn't a wrestler. She wasn't a kickboxer. She didn't do karate as a kid. She didn't do any of that. So we had to make up for that, for making, a, I had to make her a long amateur career. And so my goal was to get her like 20 fights, whether it be MMA or kickboxing and do as much jujitsu as we can. And, you know, she's, um, she's just catches on really fast and works really hard and, um, is a coach's dream. Basically, you know, she puts like eight hours a day into the gym. She does all the training too. She, does also her extra stuff like running and lifting and stuff like that. So um, she's easy. It's the, it's the other people, other guys mostly that make it hard. <laughs> well, that is that when I, when I ran a gym, uh, I always found that maybe it's because females in MMA kind of self-select, like they, they have to really push themselves to want to show up. Right. Guys, mm -hmm. which is great, but guys tend to have, this chip on their shoulders, some of them, like I'm going to prove myself. And then as soon as it gets hard, as soon as they're sucking wind because they didn't want to, you know, they're not doing well, then sometimes they kind of either get better, like they push through it or they like, off. Oh, all the women I've ever trained, they are like dynamo, go, go, go from the first day they show up. So, but it is great to have, I think a co-ed gym's great because you, you, you see a lot of work ethics, work ethic, regardless of, Talent level, I mean, sometimes your brand new, low talented guys or girls set a better example of work ethic than the, the guys or girls with more talent and more experience. So I, I think it's great to have to have that balance in a gym. Um, for you, because you mentioned Wendy came from like no background, um, you know, so obviously I think you're giving the blueprint for MMA. You have to be good at kickboxing, boxing obviously MMA, but also jiu-jitsu. So you're throwing her and all that. But for you as a coach, and this is no offense to any athlete you've ever trained, I'm not trying to get you in trouble. Do you prefer taking somebody with a wrestling background, because obviously that's your background, and adding on the rest of the components? Or do you prefer somebody coming in, let's say if they have a really good boxing, kickboxing experience, and then adding your strength, which is wrestling? For you as a coach, which one gets you more 
um, yeah. kind of excited? Well, um, it's easier to take a high level wrestler because they know what it's like to train hard. They understand what um, it takes to develop athletic ability and stuff like that. But those guys are also the most stubborn too. And they have their own ideas about how it should be. And uh, I've had some guys, you know, Cam Sandoval is one of them who developed and he's not just a wrestler anymore. He he's, you know, he's doing all the stuff and a couple other, the guys, they, they've uh, done it too, where they've become good strikers too. And that's important. And so, but for the most part, I've, I've had guys that didn't have a background. So we've had to develop a style for them. And I try not to make my guys that aren't wrestlers, wrestlers. Mm. I try and keep them, strikers and go to jujitsu and have a solid wrestling foundation. But um, that takes years and years and years to develop. And if these guys are trying to fight within a year or two of training, which I think after a year or two of training, you can fight. Um, you just have to become proficient at everything all at once. And you can't focus on one thing too much. And that's what we did with Wendy too, is I didn't make her a wrestler. Of course she does like wrestling because I love wrestling and I'm her coach and I influence her a lot, but we really work on the striking a lot and try and make that her focus on everything. So besides MMA fights, we're getting kickboxing fights. We're going to get her USA boxing card and we're going to do amateur boxing. And we're just going to get, like I said, as much uh, experience as possible before we turn her pro. Yeah. I mean, that, that obviously goes back to your game plan with, Wendy, great reference to Cam Sandoval. I just looked him up and remembered, oh, yeah, he fought for 247 and had a, a really great win over uh, a local guy, Edwin Vera. So uh, shout out to him. And that was that was even a guillotine. So but to to your point, it makes sense to me that there are some habits in wrestlers, pure wrestlers, you know, have tons of experience. One of them as a non wrestler stand on the outside is sometimes, obviously, at your level, you've broken yourself with a habit, but some wrestlers in the middle of a fight still go down to that crouch. You know, they still go down to the wrestling stance because, obviously, they drill and drill and drill there. And if they get hit and go down to that stance, that can, you know, put them in more danger and, you know, those type things, particularly when knees are legal and stuff like that. But to your point, one of the things that I'm sure you as a coach I can hear is you have to know when to hold yourself back as a coach because you don't need – a non-wrestler who's going in MMA to go to worlds in wrestling or Olympic wrestling, or even D one, you need mm -hmm. him or her to be able to out wrestle in MMA, but, yep. but not in a pure wrestling sense. And obviously we just saw triple C almost win his comeback fight, but it's very rare to have somebody who is at the absolute pinnacle of wrestling, then transition to MMA at the absolute top. Obviously he's one of one. Even DC, who had an incredible MMA career, he had a great wrestling career, but even he didn't place in in wrestling at the Olympic level. So uh, there's a lot there, there's a lot there, and I always have to reference GSP in every interview because he's my favorite fighter, and I get made fun of when I reference him, when I don't reference him. But one of the things that was cool about GSP, you know, one of Canada's greatest athletes of all times, he was selling out arenas, and he was definitely a UFC champ at the time. I forget which fight he was. He took a little time off, trained with the Canadian Olympic wrestling team, because, of course, he wanted to wrestle for Canada. They wanted him. And even though he's a dominant wrestler in MMA, he didn't have middle school, high school, or college wrestling. It worked really well in MMA. But no offense to GSP, he wasn't a pure wrestler. He wasn't going to be able to compete at the Olympic level. He tried it. It wasn't going to work at that level. So I think it's good for you as a great wrestler to know what what wrestlers need in MMA is different than like a pure wrestling. So it's just kind of a cool tie into what you were saying. Yep. Yep. I agree hundred percent. Yeah. Well, we were hoping to have Wendy uh, jump back on the show to talk a little. Oh man. Perfect timing. Yeah. Woo! Okay. Wendy. Perfect. I didn't yes. know if you were going to be able to make it. Wendy, welcome back to the show. It's an honor to have you on the show again. After having you on several times, obviously it was great uh, getting to know your husband. And I've met him as your coach before when you came up um, and fought Carly Joe Thomas, which was great to meet you. And you had an incredible performance. You were nominated 
for a submission of the year, I think, for 3247, if I remember right. Um, let's talk a little bit. Your your husband slash coach gave a great breakdown of sort of your future and what you're working on as far as your MMA. But we do have a really important topic to bring up because you were supposed to be fighting on the card with him. I'll have you break the news and kind of give your thoughts on what has transpired. Yeah, so um, I was supposed to fight in uh, Minnesota, actually, on May 20th. Um, but unfortunately, my opponent um, passed away in a car accident yesterday. And so that fight won't be happening. But I, I really wanted to um, give my condolences out to her friends and family. Um, she was really young. She was only 21. And um, I just hope, you know, everyone is living their lives to the best of their ability and enjoying what they're doing. And because um, you never know, you never know when your last day is going to be. So, yeah, that's that's beyond tragic. And obviously, that's way more serious and important than just an MMA fight not being able to happen. That that really that really hits home. You know, when Anthony Rumble Johnson died right before Christmas, that hit a lot in the MMA fan community, not just because of what he did as an MMA fighter, but him as a person. So uh, let's let's say her name just so that we, we, the people can be praying for for her family. Um, her name is Shaley Lit. So very very sorry for her family, and uh, obviously you're you're incredibly uh, you're incredibly kind to to you know to want to come on and talk about that. We won't really out of respect to her and her family won't really jump in to what might be next for you. I, I can't wait to have you back on once once you get your next fight lined up, whatever that is. We'll talk about it there, but obviously what's important now is uh, for, for her friends and family to, to grieve her and what a, what a tragic loss. Um, and I know it was a car accident. And so one thing we always try to point out there is to, to be as safe when you're driving out there as possible. We don't, I don't know the situation, but for people that drive all day, I drive over an hour and 15 minutes each way to work. Sometimes you take, you take travel for granted. So everybody out there be very safe and conscious and be kind when you're driving to be looking out for other people, but what, what a heartbreaking loss for, for her and her family and a young up and comer in the MMA community at only 21 years old. So it's a very serious kind of sad end to what's a great interview, obviously, but life is more important than just MMA. Your husband was talking about how he had a bad accident that obviously it's beautiful. Praise God that he lived and he's doing as well as he is, but obviously that affected MMA. So life is more important than just what you're doing in the cage, but, it's always an honor to have you guys on the show. Um, and so I hope to have Kelly on once you win your retirement fight. You can come back on and talk about how great that was. And Wendy, whatever you've got next, let me know. Can't wait to have both of you back on. Um, Kelly, is there something you want to say? Any sponsors you want to thank or anything like that before we wrap up? Always want to is, there any, is there any more girls up in that area that want to fight? I don't know. We We've been trying pay. to get before. We're trying to find some, what, I don't know, Pennsylvania, is there any girls in Pennsylvania? It seems like there's only guys fighting in Pennsylvania. Uh, call them out, call them out. Uh, Jim, Jim. We don't know who, Who's the, who do we need to call out? Who's the people? There's, there's really, there's, yeah. there's I, I don't know. <laughs> there's nobody that I know of. Jim Mooney is my scapegoat here because he's, you guys know him. He's the matchmaker for 247 and congratulations he's to him. He just went, Sorry. He just went, he just went full time with the promotion, so hopefully he has more time. But I will needle him uh, right now to say that hopefully uh, he would love to get. He loves if you don't know, if people don't know, Jim Moody, head match maker for two four seven. He loves putting on uh, female fights because it's important to MMA. But it's very entertaining. He's even done a card where the main event what was a female fight. So obviously, I know he's on board uh, for Wendy. Wendy absolutely impressed. I, I just don't know any fighter in the area um, that, that's at that level. But um, if somebody comes the, up. Does anybody have the belt for 247? What weight category are you? 125 or even 115. 125. One, no, I mean, the only person, Sid Sid Ross? Yeah, well, I don't know her. That's the only one that's at that weight category that I know of. I, I know she hasn't fought in a little bit. I fought at one point. I'm trying to make sure I don't say anything to get me in trouble. I thought at one point she was looking, because she's been on the show, love Sid. Um, I believe she was looking to go pro. Um, I, I'm not going to speak for her because that hasn't happened, but 
But the last time I knew they were trying to match Vicker, they were looking for her to go pro. But if you want to use this time to call her out for a potential title fight, go for it. Jim Mooney loves when I match make on this show. So go for it. Sydney Ross. Yeah, do it. Let's do it. Sydney Ross, let's fight. Let's do it. There you go. I'll, you Three, called seven. her out. For the belt. Let's do it for the belt. If she has a fun in a while, it might be good to get one before she turns pro. That I think that uh, that works. Hopefully, there's interest there. She comes from a great gym, and she was actually the the fighter I was talking about when I said that there was a there was a main event. It wasn't I'm trying to remember if it was for the belt, but there was a main event, and Sydney Ross was in the main event against another uh, talented fighter, and I think that was the last fight that that she fought. So, uh, ideally, it's a win win for me as a as a, a commentator. I love watching great fights. So you're a great fighter. She's a great fighter. It makes sense to me. Um, but hopefully, hopefully her camp and Jim Mooney also think it makes sense. I try to stay out of, um, out of telling them what to do, but honestly, sounds like a dream matchup to me. So, uh, Jim Mooney, hopefully that works out and, uh, maybe, maybe down the road, even as a potential pro fight, because, you know, both your guys' careers are going to continue, uh, to excel. Something that we were talking to Kelly about is what it looks like once an amateur goes pro, obviously every fight is even more important and more significant. Um, that then when you're kind of free to do different things in amateur. So thanks, Kelly. That that made it really zippy at the end. I appreciate it. Um, it I was trying to remember your weight. I was trying to remember your weight class because I was thinking Sid would probably be the the other one. There was a 145er um uh Cheyenne Hall who's been on the show. She's now at the pro level. And I know 45 is obviously too big for you, plus she's a pro. So I was trying to go through who has been fighting for 247. I appreciate you guys coming on. It, it's been a blast. Can't wait to have you on many more times and hopefully fighters out of your gym uh, at Battleborn BJJ and MMA in the future. You've been listening to Luke Basin with MMA Fancast with Kelly and his wife, Wendy Edison. Thanks so much, guys, for coming on. Thank you. You got it, guys. Have a good one. All right. All right.